next time on Take Me Through It, we continue our conversation with Dr. Mark Shellhammer of the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Uh, Mark spent three years as the chief scientist for human research at NASA. And in this episode, we continue to talk to him about the long-term and short-term effects that space travel has on human beings. It's a fascinating episode. Can't wait to continue the conversation. I'm B.J. Fennell. Dr. Mark Shellhammer and Mike Fennell join me this time on Take Me Through It. Take Me Through It is made possible by people like you. Thank you for downloading, listening, and subscribing. And leave us a comment on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you. Elon Musk has stated unequivocally, I, I don't know how unequivocally, but, but uh, pretty straightforwardly that he would like to put a colony on Mars in, I don't know, what is it? Actually, it's, I think it's less than 20 years. Or, yeah. I mean, is that just hot air or is there any possibility that he could pull that off? with or with, And would it be with or without NASA? Would it be entirely private? Um, do you know anything about that? What's your feeling about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I know what's been said, and I know kind of know you know what the word on the street is. I mean, I don't have really inside information, just like what my colleagues say and what their point of view is. It, I have to say, though, for, wasn't it somebody who said back in the great newspaper days, you you don't want to pick a fight with somebody who buys ink by the barrel, and I'm not sure I want to pick a fight with somebody who builds his own rockets. <laughs> but right. nevertheless, right. <laughs> um, let me say, uh, Elon Musk is not going to be sending colonies of people to Mars in 20 years. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, where's the rocket? For example, you know, I mean, there is no doubt that Elon Musk is has done and is going to continue to do amazing things in space, and I have no qualms about that. And don't hold, well, as a NASA person, I don't hold any grudges to that. There's no animosity towards him doing that. I think it's fan fantastic because he's a big fan of NASA as, as well. He, he, I saw him speak at a conference just a few months ago, and he was on stage with NASA personnel. So that, that relationship maybe had been rocky at times, but it's a good, strong relationship. They, it's complementary. But that's, it's, it is really hard to send people to Mars. You know, we haven't even sent people back to the moon yet, and those missions were really dangerous. You know, you look at the mission reports from the Apollo missions, man, that stuff, it, it looked like it was routine because we did it over and over again, but that, there's nothing routine about sending people that far away from Earth. So I, I applaud the ambition, and the thing that Musk has done that, I, that is ab absolutely crucial, maybe mo the most important thing, he's made it possible to talk about this stuff, what we used to call in the commercial suborbital field, the giggle factor. You know, you talk about, because I would go around to my colleagues and say, you know, we're going to, do you have anything you can do on suborbital spaceflight? This is what a suborbital spaceflight is, and people are going to be waitlist for about five to ten minutes, and it's going to cost two hundred thousand dollars, and blah 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 blah. And like they look at you like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> are you kidding me? This is like this is come on, let's do some real science here. And the same thing in in Mars, right? Ten fifteen years ago, yeah, okay, you're one of those space geeks who thinks that we're going to go to Mars, but now people talk about going to Mars seriously. And it because it's seriously going to happen. Is it going to happen with hundreds of people in 20 years? I don't think so. But it may happen with three people in 20 years and maybe 10 people shortly after that or whatever. But so I don't know. But so I will say two things. No, I don't think that exactly is going to happen. And what Elon Musk does Musk does make happen within 15 to 20 years will be almost equally amazing as that. But I don't think he'll do that. Uh, one, one specific about, about space travel and, and how it affects the, uh, the human body is the issue of, of radiation mm -hmm. and a prolonged flight to Mars and back and 
that's always an issue. How much do we know? How dangerous that is, or do or, or do we not know a lot? Or do, you know, what's what's sort of the the current knowledge about that issue? Yeah. Yeah, great question because that's one of the that's one of the potential showstoppers. Let, let's say it's one of the major risks. So. So again, if we if we had video here, I could show you the great chart that NASA puts together that runs the human research program where I was and that basically guides the prioritization of the of the research. Number two, I will mention though, interestingly, because this is uh, you might want to talk about, is what they call cognitive and behavioral issues. This, as I say in my talks, um, look around the room, pick your three best friends everybody else leaves the room, we close the doors, nobody gets in or out for three years. That's the cognitive and behavioral issues. So long, best friends. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, somebody may not come back alive from a Mars mission, and it might not be because of the radiation. So, uh, nevertheless, that's number two on NASA's list. And this is a flexible list, it, you know, priorities change. But cognitive and behavioral is a, is, a, is a big deal. But radiation right now is number one because of what you what you just mentioned and there's a number of aspects to it there's there's the fact that we don't the the radiation environment in deep space cosmic galactic galactic cosmic rays gcr and solar particle events solar flares things like that mass ejections uh, the because of those things, the radiation environment in deep space, meaning outside of low Earth orbit, is a lot worse than it is in low Earth orbit. So even though astronauts on the space station are considered radiation workers and they wear dosimeters, they can spend a year or, or more uh, in, in space, low Earth orbit, because they're protected by the magnetic field of the Earth, Van Allen radiation belts, all that stuff. But once you get beyond that, then you're exposed to the real to the real thing. And so, because of that, we don't know. We don't have a lot of really good answers about the effects of radiation on, that type of radiation on humans. We have effects of this, we know some of the effects of radiation on humans from atomic bomb survivors, people who are getting radiation therapy for various things. You look at the side effects, and then you look at what kind of medications you can take to mitigate the side effects and you think well maybe if I could draw on those kinds of things and those are might be the kinds of pharmaceutical countermeasures you might want to use for deep space radiation but we don't know for sure so there's a real limit to what you can do earth-based in terms of earth-based research for people in long duration is there any such thing as some kind of shielding on the spacecraft or I guess <laughs> lead shielding on the spacecraft wouldn't work so good for <laughs> for, for <Yeah>. launch <laughs> reasons but. hydrocarbons of various kind plastics mm -hmm. uh, tend to be good at sh absorbing the, some types of radiation it's now I don't know my radiation physics as well as I as I probably should and I say that every time this question comes up and I never have really looked into it but my understanding is that there are some forms of shielding <clears throat> that make the problem worse because in effect they slow down some forms of radiation and then there are secondary radiation on the other side of the shield. So a particle, a radioactive particle will hit the outside of the shield and instead of that particle just zooming right through the person's body it will be it will knock off other particles from the shield which are traveling slower and therefore spend more time in the body and have longer time to deposit energy and cause damage so you've got this pernicious problem where you try to shield and you make the problem some forms of the problem worse and then there's the fact of yes shielding is heavy what you might do is one of the one of the ideas that I've seen kicked around for, for a long time is that you you have a certain basically a fallout shelter in the in the spacecraft. You have a small space where you can go if you think something bad is coming, like you've detected a solar flare, a solar particle event, and that's the place where also they are storing the water 
in containers around the circumference of the spacecraft. So the water absorbs some of the radiation. Uh, you can't afford, because of mass and volume, to do that for the whole spacecraft, but that's where you go just to hide out for as long as it, as long as it takes. But radiation is, is a potential, well, I don't want to call, I, I call it a showstopper. It could be a showstopper. Probably not, though. There's two, there's, there's two aspects to it. There's the long-term aspects, in a possible, very likely increase in lifetime, li uh, lifetime probability of acquiring certain forms of cancer, which does and does not fall under NASA's purview. You don't want to be cavalier about that, but to some extent you can say that by the time we're ready to send people to Mars, cancer therapies and treatments will be a lot more developed than they are. So not that anybody likes the idea of increasing anyone's cancer risk. You know, if you're going to go to Mars, and, and if I'm going to say to you, I, I'll send you to Mars on a three-year journey and you'll be world famous, but you know, you're much going to be 20% more likely to get cancer. I think a lot of us would take that bet. So, okay, it's it may be a fair, uh, may be a fair deal. But there are acute effects as well of some forms of, uh, of radiation, meaning that uh, immediate effects, including what we think it may be cognitive effects. So you may be halfway to Mars and you get a solar flare, solar particle event, and you take a hit on your cognitive function when you're far away from Earth, depending on just you, the crew, the small number in the crew to perform at your peak. Now, astronauts are amazing individuals they could take a cognitive hit and they could still outperform the vast majority of people. <laughs> but you don't want to do that to them if you can avoid it. I, as a filmmaker, I, I see a movie and it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's solar flare and everybody goes crazy. It turns into zombies yes. or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, they, or they start, yeah. I mean, you, the thing is, it's part of the idea that you start, this is what's drive. this is the, the thing that's driving me now. Uh, uh, intellectually and conceptually uh, uh, what that I'm trying to approach is that this might sound not sound like a big deal so maybe they take a small cognitive decline maybe their reaction time increases by two milliseconds or you know whatever or they take an effective hit on IQ hit by five or ten points whatever so they go down from 180 to 170 okay big deal they're still gonna you know do their jobs but combined with the physiological effects, combined with the with the isolation and confined, combined with everything else, you're chipping away at the margin of error, and that's what concerns me. You know, they, astronauts they can work through any one of these particular things, but it's this combination of things, and then something happens on the spacecraft that, under normal circumstances, they would be well able to take care of, and now all of a sudden they can't effectively deal with because of this. Com this this uh, uh, combination of circumstances. So I mean, really, the whole thing is a is a risk reward issue. It's 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 how much how much risk is NASA? I would I would assume a con fairly conservative bureaucra bureaucracy willing to take, and maybe Elon Musk's company is more willing to take higher levels of risk. Absolutely. You're, yes, NASA, NASA approaches this actually as a risk management operation. And this largely defined what I did at NASA for my two and a half to three years as, as chief scientist for human research, which is process of risk mitigation. So you, you find you identify the major risks, radiation, cognitive behavioral, bone, muscle, those all those kinds of things, and you try to prioritize them based on likelihood and consequence. So it's classic risk management stuff that is applied in engineering and other cultures all the time on Earth. It's just that it's, it's an unusual way to do science. Scientists do not like this at all because that's not how, that's not how most science works. So this is like science on a schedule, science with specific goals in mind, but it, it's, NASA, it's not a science operation, it's an exploration operation. Right, because right, there's so many, unlike engineering, like, like building a building and stresses, those, are, those things are completely known, right. whereas there's things that are totally unknown. 
right. that may you may not even be thinking of, as you I think you said earlier, that would come yeah. up in the course of a long mission. That right. So that's the shortcoming of this of this approach is that NASA has very rigorously and very seriously and and they do this actually quite well. Uh, the, the process of figuring out what risks are the ones that are going to be most important, which ones need research, what's the likelihood of coming up with with uh, countermeasures and then being able to validate those countermeasures in appropriate environments, whether it's in space or on some kind of ground analog, and do this in a timely manner so that in about 10 years we can say with some confidence it's okay to send people to Mars in 20 years or so. So very formal, very structured uh, and rigorous process to do that, but just what you said, it, the thing that that bugs me about it uh, and that I tried to break down a little bit while I was at NASA with some success, and they're getting a little bit better at it, but systematically they don't look at the interactions, but neither does anybody else, neither does NIH, neither does the School of Medicine where I am. Medical and biomedical research generally is very much discipline specific. So everybody knows that the cardiovascular system is affected by stress level and that affects the immune system and that affects other forms of physiology and, and endocrine function and all these things are connected. But <clears throat> you go to the doctor and you have a cardiovascular problem, you see a cardiologist whose specialty is cardiology. And they all know that these things all interact and you know they will they will try to take these other things into account but generally they are treated and studied in a discipline specific manner but you can't afford to ignore these connections when you're talking about small a small number of people on a really demanding mission like a mars mission that's my contention is that you'd we need to do better we need to start looking at the interconnections so thank you for setting me up on that <laughs> this is why he's here yeah <laughs> mike Finnell from the take me through a research <laughs> department thank you for your questions very well, good very astute mike gets an extra shot of bourbon <laughs> <laughs> whether he does well here or not. <laughs> <laughs> right let's let me ask you this our guest is uh, dr mark shellhammer associate professor at the johns hopkins medical school what's next for you dr shellhammer what are you working on now well, I'm trying to reinvigorate both my academic research career and my amateur semi-professional music career. And what better <laughs> music, what better way to start it than appearing on this, uh, well, this internationally known podcast? That's right. I am hoping that the, that the uh, support comes pouring in, whether it's moral support or, or money. <laughs> I'll take either. <laughs> not necessarily in that order. Yeah, it, <laughs> definitely not in that order. Right, all right. Well, let's no, get, no. What, let's get to the music in a second. I do want to talk about that. Let's talk about that first uh, first subject. I, so what's next for me is, is exact is ex what I just talked about. What I'm trying I'm trying to recategorize or reinvigorate my research career. So, so it's nominally as a sensory motor researcher, a vestibular researcher, looking at how sensory motor function, how the brain puts together vision vestibular information from the balance system, proprioceptive information from muscle sense, things like that to make a coherent picture of the world, where you are in the world, your orientation, balance. And as you might imagine, this gets affected in some ways adversely when you send people into space because gravity is one of those key signals that the body uses and the brain uses to establish a frame of reference for, for movements. So that's what's kept me that's what's basically paid me for you know, 35 years or so as a graduate student and as a researcher. Now, having seen the bigger picture, but basically going back to one of your very first questions, I've seen the, the interconnections of these things. And so what I'm trying to do now is, as a researcher, investigate some of these interconnections in a little bit more rigorous way. So let me just give you one simple example, and this is a this is like a cartoon caricature version of the uh, 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 of the of these interconnections, but it's a but it's small enough to be feasible in the with with the limited laboratory environment that I that I have access to, and that is we we typically look at how people adapt to sensory motor perturbations. So as an example. I can put a 10 pound mass on your head or on your arm, or I can give you uh, spectacles 
that magnify the, the world, the visual scene, by 100%. So everything is bigger than it looks like, which changes, among other things, the amount that you have to move your eyes every time you move your head to maintain stable gaze. It's called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. It's been studied extensively for a long, long time, including by me. And But it's typically studied in just that kind of by itself, has its own thing. In other words, you come into the laboratory, I put this little perturbation thing on you, and I study how you perform in a task that's designed to study how you adapt to that thing, you know, a very specific thing. But if I put you in a working environment, like an office environment, and I give you one of these perturbations that screws you up, well, it's going to slow down your ability to do your work tasks, maybe typing at the computer. Maybe every time now you get up to go to the bathroom or go up to get a cup of coffee, <clears throat> you have to put a little bit of extra effort into it or else you're going to trip and fall or else you're going to bump into something. That's going to start to bug you, so you're going to start to change maybe your interaction with your colleagues in that work environment. So now we're going to start to see changes in team cohesion and, and interpersonal behavior. Maybe we're going to see some increase in your stress level, so your heart rate may change respiration will change and the coupling of them will change maybe your skin resistance will change because you're sweating a little bit more because you've got this all of a sudden you've got everything it takes extra time and that's starting to bug you rarely if ever do people look at that spectrum of effects as a consequence of this simple very almost trivial sensory motor perturbation so that's one of the things that I propose to do. And then say, over the course of a few hours, as, you would, as the person adapts to that, which they do relatively quickly, how do these physiological and psychological things then reorganize to come back to a normal thing? And it sounds like a gimmick. And in that, what I just described is a little gimmicky. But you know, people with a vestibular illness, people with some kind of uh, uh, debilitating neuromuscular disease or something like that, this is a process that they go through all the time. But they're always looked at, you send them to rehab to rehab the function of that particular thing that went wrong. What about how is it affecting your personal life? How is it affecting your nutritional needs? How is it affecting a hundred other things that are generally not, not looked at? So you ask, what's next for me? What's next for me is trying to study those interactions in a in a rigorous way, in an intellectually honest way. It, it's almost trivial just to say, yeah, well, they're all connected. Of course they're all connected. Right. Yeah, what do, you, what do you do about that? What's the proper conceptual model for looking at those interactions? The proper mathematical constructs for looking at those interconnections. I'm a biomedical engineer by training. It's got it's to have some math behind it to make it rigorous and to make it believable. Uh, so that's what's that's what's next for me. Yeah, so it's not just about boosting performance; <clears throat> it's about helping people who may have some kind of affliction in these areas. It's about, in that sense, maintaining performance. I would say, or enhancing resilience, and in this case, the resilience being the ability to recover from this perturbation, from this anomaly. In space, you could maybe see the direct application of how this kind of line of thinking goes. There's, in space is full of perturbations, right? I can get, I don't know what's gonna happen when you send people to Mars, but I can guarantee something that we didn't predict and anticipate is gonna happen, either medically or physiologically or operationally or whatever. So we need to have crews who are resilient physiologically, psychologically, has individuals, has teams, so that they can deal with these kinds of things. So that's the kind of intellectual line that connects those things. Another specific, um, is there a serious effort to, to, address, to address artificial gravity? In other words, I, I remember in 2001, there was that big wheel that, that spun that allowed them to um, not float around and have artificial gravity. I mean, is that is that something that would be considered important for a, a yes. long space mission? And is it is it even doable? Does it add too many complications, et cetera? 
Yeah. <clears throat> is, is it worth the it's, effort, basically, in terms of what it would mitigate from, from a, a biomedical standpoint? That is a great question, and that comes up. Uh, if I make the mistake of hanging around too long after one of my talks, <laughs> undoubtedly... <laughs> you <laughs> <that> did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I did it again. Yeah. I think I would know better. <clears throat> that that question almost always comes up, and it's a because it's a good question. And so, uh, let me give you some of the stock answers first. First of all, my 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 old colleague and, and um, thesis advisor at, at at MIT, Larry Young, who has studied artificial gravity for decades, says that this is a solution that comes keeps coming around and around. And around, and around, and around, right. Uh, yeah, that's a MIT humor. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all it's you a, physicists. Yeah, that <laughs> it gets a big laugh at the faculty club. <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, and for a while, artificial gravity was described as everybody's second favorite solution. Well, I haven't heard it described that lately, but that's what we used to say. In other words, you talk to the cardiovascular people. What do you need? Well, here's what we really need. And if we can't have that, artificial gravity would be good. And the sensory motor people, the same thing, the bone people, the muscle people, you know, all, all, all these different groups. So it's like, it's like in, in some sense, at least the lowest common denominator. Like everybody can at least agree that that's helpful. It's probably gone up in stature since then because it's a really good countermeasure for many things. It turns out that it looks like there are consequences that we're just starting to see now of the shift, the headward shift of body fluids, cerebrospinal fluid, blood, lymph, from the lower part of the body to the upper part of the body when you go into space. I mean, this is not a surprise. We've known about that for a long time. Astronauts feel sinus congestion. You can see their, pace, their faces look puffy because there's that distribution. But so far, it's been pretty. It's been thought of as pretty benign, just an annoyance. And now we're starting to see that there may be some actually more serious consequences of that. We don't know how serious yet. So if you can put people into artificial an artificial gravity setting, you take that problem away because you've imposed gravity and you suck the fluids back down where they where where nature intended them to be, down at the generally toward the torso and the lower part of the body. Okay, so there are some possibly compelling reasons why you might want to do it, but it's it's not cheap in terms of engineering. The structure of the vehicle has to tolerate it. Uh, there's some energy required in spinning the vehicle, spinning the vehicle up, and if you're going to stop spinning the vehicle when, for example, you get to Mars, or maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe you have the part in the middle that doesn't that doesn't spin. So there's lots of ways to do it, and engineers have been continuing to look at it. My understanding of the current situation, the current party line from NASA, from the people who make this decision, it is that artificial gravity won't, will not be used <clears throat> systematically on the first Mars missions. It's just too many unknowns to get it into the system for now. But let me, let me talk a little bit uh, about some of the aspects of artificial gravity. First of all, we, don't, we have no idea, I mean no idea, about how much you would actually need to stop the debilitation is 0.1 G, so 1 G is what you get on Earth, is 0.1 G for an hour a day in space enough to stop the, a lot of the degradation, the, the debilitating aspects, or do you need 0.9 G for 20 hours a day? I mean, that's a huge difference. In one case, you might be able to spin the bed while you sleep, mm. you know, spin it mm -hmm. around your head. And there's, there's something something at MIT called the artificial, it was originally called the Artificial Gravity Sleeper, AGS. Now I think they call it the Artificial Gravity S Simulator, something like that. But that was the original idea when it, when it was made, is that maybe eight hours a day of some partial G, and it's not even across the whole body because it's still zero G at the head around where you're spinning, but it's it could be approximately one G at the feet. So you're still sucking fluids down, loading the bones, loading the muscles. <clears throat> Is that enough? Also, you're in a spinning environment, which carries some other consequences, some uh, uh, sensory motor and neurovestibular consequences. So 
if anybody who doubts this, get yourself a bar stool, spin yourself around, and while you're spinning, tilt your head. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you will not tumble out I of the I do that every stool. time I go to a bar. <clears throat> That's right. Why just the other night? <laughs> Well, and that is why you are the official scientific advisor for this <laughs> for this program. Uh, we're all scientists at some at some <laughs> level. So there are there are people don't think about the some of the possible adverse consequences. Is it likely that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages, including not only the physiological disadvantages but some of the engineering disadvantages? We don't know because we don't yet know what the benefits are. So that's my very very long-winded way of saying. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know we have, there's a lots of people who would like to do it, and NASA starts up the program for a while, and then other priorities take over. So it's it's hard in some ways to justify an artificial gravity program at this point in time with a limited timeline to getting answers and limited budgets and limited resources when you know that radiation is going to be a problem, when you know that cognitive and behavioral issues are going to be a problem as an example, and those will not be mitigated by artificial gravity. So, you know, it's a cost-benefit trade-off in terms of which risks you mitigate, how you select, mm -hmm. how you mm -hmm. prioritize them. Artificial gravity is very appealing because it mitigates a, a large number of risks. Bone, muscle, cardiovascular, aerobic capacity, a lot of the fluid consequences of fluid shifts, I just named five or six right there. So artificial gravity is great for those, but those might be already mitigated by exercise and some other countermeasures. So then you say instead of spending a lot of effort and time and money on and resources of various kinds on artificial gravity, yeah, maybe we'll let that go for now because we have radiation problems to deal with as, a, as an example. But is it all worth it, all this money, all this effort, all this risk to explore, specifically explore space? We've been doing it, been doing it pretty well uh, for more than 60 years. Should we continue to do it? Of course, we should continue to do it. And, and why? I don't know. I can't give you a solid, um, I'll direct you to my paper that I have, may have mentioned in the coming out in the latest version, for the latest edition of Space Policy Journal. Not available at your local newsstand. That's right. Can we find it online? <clears throat> I hope so. <laughs> You can find it online, but you'll have to pay for the article. Okay. Uh, but Or, like I said, I may be able to send you a copy. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, But I do address some of these issues because it's on my mind. I don't think anybody investigates this, this area without thinking about this at, at some point. And certainly, I'm not in it for the money. Uh, I, have a, I have a passion about space exploration. So let me give you some, I, there's no killer, kill, killer app solution, right? There's no clincher argument. It's explore, a lot of the, I wrote this art, article to some extent to start to, to try to counter some of the argument that I get from my scientific colleagues, which is to say that, you know, scientifically speaking, we're, maybe we're better off not sending people into space. You know, a lot of these astronomical sciences, the physical sciences, maybe you, you, you don't really need people. You can do it automated. And the undercurrent of a lot of the arguments being, you know, you, if you didn't send people into space in the first place, you wouldn't have to study how people adapt to space. In other words, not uh, unstated, in other words, there's nothing inherently scientifically interesting with knowing how people adapt to space flight. And that is where I draw the line. That I think is untrue. It's like saying, is there anything scientifically inherently interesting about understanding how stars form or what drives a supernova? Well, yeah, there is. Okay, then why is it not equally inherently interesting to know what happens when you put people in an environment completely alien to the way we evolved and developed, which is in a gravity field? Why is that not a legitimate scientific question? It is. Just as legitimate as looking at a variety of astronomical questions. So to, uh, that's, that's part of the sci what I'll call the scientific rationale from my point of view, from a biomedical scientist's point of view. The big picture answer in my, in my view is it's exploration. And that's what people do. 
So it, people sometimes make the mistake, especially some of my scientific colleagues, of saying, well, you, we don't need to, let's not send people into space. Let's use that money for real science, and there's no point in sending people into space. Well, okay, even if I accept your argument, which I don't, but even if I accept your argument that scientifically you don't have to send people in space, that's not the only reason you send people into space. You send them there to explore. While we're sending them there to explore, hey, isn't it great that we can do some good science with them too? So give us credit for doing the science on them there. Don't blame us for doing the science on them there. All right, science is all well and good, but what about the music? Tell us more about that. Um, yeah, well, I play drums, jazz mostly, but you know, like like most amateur or semi-professional musicians, if you're paying for it, I'll play any style you want, uh, passably sometimes. Uh, I mean, uh, do you do weddings? Uh, I have done weddings occasionally. Yes, I played at my own my own wedding <laughs> well, at, the, at the reception. If you, if you won't play at your own wedding, <laughs> what wedding will you <laughs> play? At? How good can you possibly well, be? Fun. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how how thrilled my wife was. I had to <laughs> abandon her and go and because they had, they let me sit in with. We hired a big. My wife hired a big band for our. Which is, which is one of my favorite forms of jazz, and so I got to sit in with two. That's the first time I had played in front of an audience for like 20 years or something. It was really a big kick for me. But I, it's something I put aside. I was fairly serious about it you know, through high school, but I, not enough to be a professional or anything like that. But I put it aside largely when I when I did my higher education, and then I started getting back into it 15 years ago or so, and. Uh, was in a number of bands, small groups and jam sessions and things like that. Just, you know, not real serious, but uh, but tolerable. You know, pretty good, good enough to play out and get paid for it occasionally. And uh, so it's um, now that I'm back from Houston, I'm starting to do more of that. So it's a lot of fun because it's for me, it's therapeutic. It's so different. Although music is very mathematical, but generally it's so different from what I do on, in my work day. It's different people. In many cases, it's a different group of people. It's a different. They're they're not my scientific peers, so they think a little bit differently. And uh, and it's just you. It's totally absorbing. So you can't really do music well and be thinking about the problems of your job. So you've got no choice but. I mean, you can do it, but then you play poorly. So you have no choice but to, but to forget about your regular concerns, and you can get better at it. You know, it's not like just like, you know, I zone out by watching TV. No, I mean, you have to, you want to keep up with it and not embarrass yourself when you play, so you get better at it. So that's the that's the music story. So do you play like, gigs around the Baltimore area on weekends, or? Not at the moment. Okay. I did for a, for a while, occasionally. I mean, my peak was a few years ago. I think I had forty. I think I played forty gigs in one year. Some of them were playing at a nursing home, right. for example, for their brunch and things like that. These are not. You, you would not see our name show up in the local paper for you to come and buy a hundred, pay a hundred dollars to come see us play. Just just yeah. local, just not local yet. stuff. Not yet. Just okay. local stuff, just for fun. Who are the great drummers? Who do you do you emulate yourself after anybody, or who do you really think was the top? I mean, I know some of the top names, but well, I you know, know who the top names are. I Buddy mean, Rich. Buddy Rich. Of course, I grew up listening to Buddy Rich, and um, see that. Listen carefully. Hold on a second. Listen. That. That's yeah. Mason the intern, the four-legged intern. He keeps a pretty good beat. He does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I recognize that beats. That's that's on Buddy Rich's second album. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what song that is. That's second right chorus. <clears throat> um, but that you know that Buddy Rich is a bad influence because uh, every every drummer wants to. Well, maybe the, not so much. The newer generations haven't heard of Buddy Rich as much as before. But clearly, he was phenomenal and arguably the best drummer in the world even to this day. He would certainly have said so. He did say so <laughs> a number of times. But every drummer wants to be Buddy Rich. Every trumpet player wants to be Maynard Ferguson. You hear these stories. But we're, none of us are Buddy Rich. I mean, some are closer than others. So you make the mistake of thinking you can play like Buddy Rich while not being Buddy Rich, and all you do is make noise. 
right? You think you, as a drummer, you feel like every gap in a song has to be filled with my clever intrusions. Every every little opportunity, if there can be no silence, every little opportunity has to be filled with some phenomenal drum thing. And uh, that is a big mistake because as Dizzy Gillespie said, the thing that he learned later on in his years as a musician was what not to play. And as a drummer, that is really hard to do. That is really hard not to, to restrain yourself from just making another noise. And But that's musically what's best to do. So I've started listening less to Buddy Rich and more to Joe Morello, who were, played with uh, Dave Brubeck, Take Five, famous solos, phenomenal. That's, jazz. that's his solo in Take Five? Oh, yes. Everybody knows Joe it. Morello, everybody knows it. Steve Gadd, who was current uh, currently on the on the scene actually he's touring with with chick Corea. i'll give him a, a plug he's touring with chick Corea. steve gadd has played with everybody the famous <clears throat> drum opening in uh, 50 ways to leave your lover paul simon mm -hmm. that's steve gadd wow. and it's not just steve gadd playing it it's steve gadd created that drum riff that's what steve gadd the famous famous solo in, in uh, asia the song by Steely Dan. It's famous if you're a drummer. Mm -hmm. the, go see the interviews with the with the guys who were in the studio. They said, "Yeah, Steve Gadd read that through the first time, and that's what he played." It's just like we couldn't believe it. That Steve Gadd is amazing, and because not just because he's technically proficient, because he's musical. It just fits the music so well, and a lot of drummers aren't good at that. They're good at showing off, but not doing something that that suits the music. Right. If you start a band, I have a name for you. You just mentioned it. I would call it the Clever Intrusions. I love that. Yeah. Clever how about, Intrusions. How about this? How about this one? There, for a while before several of us moved on. It was the dream of one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Otolaryngology, uh, ear, nose, and throat. So they <laughs> easy for you to say. Yeah. So they. They, well, speech pathology is part of our department, okay. but that's your know, <laughs> right? That's the one. They so they study hearing in addition to balance and other things. So hearing. So he thought he wanted to start a small pop music group, basically, of only people in our department and call it acoustic trauma. <laughs> Now, I have an idea for your next grant, and I can't believe that the money wouldn't rush in, and that is playing drums in a weightless environment. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> I, How does weightlessness yeah. affect? There is a famous scene of Buddy Rich, may, it may be on The Muppet Show, <laughs> playing playing while they turned him upside down. Oh, was, really? Is this an episode yes. of Pigs in Space? It may be, that, pigs it may be a in Pigs in Space, space. yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. <laughs> he note, plays better upside down than I play. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> well, you've got your work cut out for you in the editing room. <laughs> that's right. That's okay. And again, I want to thank Dr. Mark Shellhammer, associate professor and astute drummer, Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School, Mike Finnell, my uh, partner in crime here, and uh, head research at the Take Me Through It podcast headquarters here in the hills of Litchfield County. And of course, uh, to Mason, our four-legged intern. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. We'll join. Please join me next time. Uh, take me through it.